What's up, man? Colton, what's up, man? How you doing? Pretty good. Give me one second here. Yeah, yeah. it's all good. How's all right. it going? Here we are. What's up, man? Not too much. Just enjoying a morning here in San Diego. Oh, man. Get out of town. San Diego. <laughs> yep. Dude, so last last year in July, I went to a wedding in Colorado, Pine, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And we drove to San Diego. We were out at Mission. Uh, well, we're the... Uh, is it Mission? Was it, wait, wait, hold on. I'm getting my wires crossed here. I can't believe I'm forgetting the name. It's right on the very edge. It's where... Um, um, there was an officer that was staying over there. Gosh dang it. It's going to so come. So like back. Mission Beach, Ocean Beach? It may have been Mission. Yeah. Um, okay. I can't believe I'm, it's, I'm drawing a total blank. <laughs> but <laughs> but it was so much fun. We were out there for three days, and it was, I mean, what an amazing place. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I heard a rumor, and I can't remember where I heard it from, but Baseball players historically don't do good in San Diego because they're all hung over and, and blasted mm -hmm. from the night before. <laughs> yeah, it's like a place that you probably shouldn't be 25 and a millionaire and try to be a pro athlete at the same time, you know? Right, exactly. <laughs> it's a bad, bad mix for sure. Yeah. So, well, hey, man, it's great to meet you. And before we get into your life as a business leader, I want to know, how did you survive COVID? How did you get through that time period? And how has it changed the way that you live your life and conduct business now? So I am actually have a really interesting uh, story around that. So about six months before COVID, I actually owned some property off the grid outside of San Diego and took up a, a remote job uh, with a construction tech startup called Pro.com. Uh, this is before COVID made everybody remote. It's just like it just happened to be like, you know, their company culture and moved out to the mountains and moved into an off the grid house, um, you know on five acres with nobody around uh so when COVID hit i really didn't feel it that much yeah like at, at least that transition phase of course going out and being social and all that stuff um you know was different but i was actually working for a startup based in seattle living off the grid uh in, in the mountain house in san diego and so um you know i still had all the same ups and downs and didn't get to see the people i wanted to see sort of thing but as far as my day-to-day -day business life um i was actually isolated i guess naturally in, in in a little bubble and could focus on the the work at hand so it was it's really interesting for me there you know i actually moved into a new house january 2020 and i'm glad that all of that transpired because i got married in july we fast-tracked mm -hmm. it and got in there so when COVID hit as bad as it was i felt like you know if we would have even tried to do this and it would have been in the middle of a global pandemic you know there's no there's no yeah. way of knowing what would have happened you know so yeah. there, there are a lot of stories like that with, with you where people started a remote. It's like they had a crystal ball and they knew what to do prior to this to get ready for it, you know? Yeah. So. And, and so where, where I'm talking about, it's about an hour outside of San Diego, 4,300 feet up into the mountains, like down a dirt road. There's no utilities or anything like that. I didn't see anybody for two weeks when COVID wow. started because it's mostly like Airbnb houses and stuff out there. Uh, not, not many full-time residents, so. It was strange. It actually was like two and a half weeks before I actually went down into civilization and saw like lines at Walmart and things like that, you know? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It just hit me. Imperial Beach was where we were at. Oh, I'd be. Yeah. That, yeah. The last one. Yeah. 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 The last place. That's cool. Yeah. So it, it was cool. It was weird because we kept smelling something in the ocean and I didn't mm -hmm. realize until I came back and did some research that some bad water from Tijuana was making its way up and the beaches were, yeah. Yeah, it'll happen anytime there's rain, which isn't super common here in San Diego, other than the winter time. You know, the Tijuana River will will flow out, and it's it's bad. I like to surf, and after a good rain, you can't surf for seventy two hours. So wow, that's wild. Yeah, yeah. and that's something mm -hmm. the locals only know. We we just we're like we're landlocked in Kansas City, so we're like, oh my god, look at all this water, look at all this this, this <laughs> things, you know. So yeah. Um, Let's get to the core of what you do for a living. I'm going to hypothetically put you in front of a bunch of third graders, career day. One of the kids looks up mm -hmm. and says, what do you do for a living? How do you answer them? Um, I listen to people and help them solve their problems. That would be the highest level overview. Now, the people that I'm listening to are builders and people in the construction industry. And the problems I'm helping them solve, the solutions I'm, I'm providing them are sort of technology oriented, right? Um. That's what we're doing here at DigiBuild. But I would say from a high level, what does my actual day-to-day -day look like? It's it's hopping on calls, listening to people talk about their current operations and how they find construction materials 
the pain points that they've experienced in doing that, which have exacerbated since COVID with supply chain issues and pricing all over the place and lead times going crazy. Um, I, and then I let them know what our software can do. We can, we can, we can have, you know, many sort of custom setups uh, based on each of those clients use cases and needs. And then I work to train them and implement them in it. It's 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 pretty simple. I mean, beyond that, I I, I do obviously work with our internal teams uh, across multiple functions. But yeah, if I said a high level of what I do is that I listen, hear their pain points, and try to help them create a solution. So when you were in the third grade, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oof, when third grade, I don't know. It probably changed every year, but in third grade probably you know it's actually kind of interesting i don't know about third grade that's that's pretty far back probably by like sixth grade i wanted to be a architect yeah and then i didn't think about construction for like eight years uh and then i kind of got back into to, to that sort of built world so i went from like architect to you know stockbroker because who want, i don't know why <laughs> looking back on it uh, i actually went to college studied economics and math in college went to graduate school for economics and then had the realization like, I, this is not what I want to do. Right. Uh, and so I, you know, these aren't my people. Right. Um, so then I, you know, jumped over and started working you know, in construction, you know, as a, as a cost estimator and cost consultant and sort of, you know, the, the more white collar side of the construction industry, um, but around people who, you know, I like to be around. So. I have never seen somebody more stressed out than whenever the news shows somebody like doing the stock market yeah. on the floor. Like I, I always used to look at that because, you know, I, I was a product of the 80s. And I remember when mm -hmm. the stock market meltdown was there and all those people were on the floor just looking like they just got waylaid. And I was like, man, who has the acumen to do that? Who who are the people? Because those are the people yeah. that are lawyers and jump out of airplanes. They're ready to go. Yeah, I know. So I know. It's and, it's, uh, and I had some friends, you know, studying economics who, who went and did that sort of thing. Stockbroker, investment bank, banker analyst. And it's like, after a year or two after college, it's like, what they, they had no life, right? It's uh, they're like staying up 10, 11 o'clock at night, office six in the morning. Yeah. And then like a couple rounds of drinks between the two. It's like, okay, well, that's a career for people who don't have like friends and people they want to hang out with and, and uh, other aspirations. So I'm glad I didn't go that route. That's for sure. Yeah, for sure. So let's go back to your childhood. Where were you born and raised and where were these seeds? How were these seeds mm -hmm. planted in you to grow into who you are and to have this desire to be in business and building and architecture? Yeah, so I'm from Mims, Florida, which is outside of a another small town called Titusville, Florida. Uh, for those who don't know, it's basically across the river from where the space shuttle used to launch and now the SpaceX oh. rockets launched there on the Space Coast. And, uh, you know, sort of a, you know, semi-rural suburb, very blue collar. Most people in my neighborhood were small business owners, mostly contractors of some sort. Um, you know, uh, so I grew up around that a lot. Um, however, when you're in a small town, you still have that, you know, when you get into high school, you still want to get out and be something different. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I did realize like that was, you know, those are the people I grew up knowing and loving um, work to helping neighbors businesses even you know building additions on my own parents house like we were we had a good life but you know our parents made us work <laughs> you know we I, I put on roofs i framed out you know hallways and uh all the every everything in between so uh you know that was always there i had the knowledge and the con the con sort of conceptual of knowledge of, of of how things were built and i did like to look at things as a puzzle and as a problem that you could you know solve piece by piece so i was attracted to that and then you know after studying economics and deciding not to go that route in college i had a opportunity to go work with the consulting company um very small niche consulting company uh that needed somebody to become a cost consultant or, or cost estimator but you know basically what they do is they would go look at really complex damages uh on a building and figure out what it would take to you know from like a scope of work and and then after that, the cost to put those buildings back together. And I'm like, hmm, this could be interesting, right? Uh, I, I could actually dive into your project and get in the weeds and get lost a little bit. And so I cut my teeth doing that and I liked it. Um, and it was really, really good. And, you know, after moving through a couple of different positions of, you know, managing, pre that led me to being a like a lead estimator at a, another large GC and then managing the whole pre-construction services for large GC, a general contractor in LA. 
um, I kind of went full circle. So in college, I said I studied economics and math. I also studied some computer science, and I kind of, you know, kept those tech skills fresh, some, some programming, scripting, data analysis. And I sort of read about this construction tech space, which was a, a emerging, you know, sort of industry because construction always lags far behind in, in technology adoption. And I kind of went full circle and put two and two together. And so I took that job with Pro.com that I was telling you about just a little bit before COVID started, um, which was a construction tech company based out of Seattle that had this cool tech where they could match uh, people wanting like, you know, sort of higher end um, ADUs and renovations and remodels with really good local general contractors. And they had this whole platform to streamline the process and make it easy up for everybody involved. And I started working with them and, uh, you know, that led me to really like the space that I was in and, and, you know, they got acquired by open door. So I, then I went and worked with an Australian construction tech firm that was sort of in the insurance space called handy. Um, and then more recently with DigiBuild, which seems to kind of be, uh, the, that piece where I feel like all of my experience and skill sets and interests are really well aligned because um, it's to the place where not only my skill sets and construction and technology are tapped into every day, but my actual interest in listening to people and solving problems, uh, you know, that my day-to-day -day life is that, which I love. Um, so, so, yeah, that, yeah that's, that's timeline. So <laughs> yeah. who's been kind of a hero for you in your life? Oh, man, many people, but I would say uh, my best friend, Zach, um, we're both from Florida, went to Florida State, um, moved, made the the trip across the country. He came out about a year after me and had all those sort of mid to late 20s uh, uh, struggles that a, a young person can have in a big city where they don't have any family and just had to become each other's rocks through that and like, you know, get to know each other and get to know ourselves through that and, uh, you know, had that. I'm lucky enough to, by the time I was like 27, 28 years old, to have like an actual ride or die person that I knew I could count on no matter what. And uh, that that helps. That's all I can say. Right on. So <laughs> if you could meet anybody alive on the planet right now and spend some time with them, who would it be? Rogan. Yeah. You like Rogan, huh? Uh, yeah. It's just, just cur seems curious and selfless. I mean, that's uh, those are big things. What a good dude, man, you know, to be yeah. a part of like kind of popular culture and to, and what he's doing is profoundly simple. You know, I mean, he's yep. just doing who he is in a way that strips away all of the corporate things that he had to deal with his whole life. And mm -hmm. everybody loves it and they open up and it's like and he's really good at it. You know, he really pulls things out of it that we would never know. And it's interesting stuff. It's cool stuff. Yeah, I yeah. actually I mean, just being a longtime regular listener, I, I think it helps me be successful in my job right now in the sense that my current job is literally being you know i could go into a meeting with the prospective client who's interested in digit and in, in demoing our software and go hit them with the sales pitch and the pitch deck and this is why you should use our software and all those sort of things but i think probably somewhat influenced by by listening to rogan i just literally go in there and ask them what their current what their current you know operations look like you know, where they're finding some pain points, like, you know, where do they think they can improve? And I just talk to them and listen. And yeah. they usually tell me exactly where they think they can improve. And then I'm like, okay, well, this is how I think our software could help you. And it's, right it's very much just like that. And I, I, you know, I haven't thought about that parallel, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I think, I think it's actually influenced how I, how I work and how I listen to people in business. So it's the power of podcasting. Sometimes it's a therapeutic yeah. session. It just pulls the subconscious out there and you just, you, you realize things. Um, yeah. So every day you wake up, you have things that you want to do that motivate you. What's the ultimate motivator for you? What is the gas in your tank? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I don't know. I just, I just like building my like relationships with a super tight, good group of friends I have, and then just having a project that I'm building. And uh, I think that's why I'm drawn to the startup world because uh, it's not, I'm, I'm, I'm part of not just building like an individual building or project or, you know, construction project, but I'm part of building a, this little organization. It's like an organism that's growing that is a startup. Um, but beyond that, it's definitely like, you know, probably the handful of really, really, really good people in my life that, are also, you know, at similar phases in their life and have similar interests. Uh, we like doing the same thing. Like I told you before, I have the the house and property off the grid out in the, here in the mountains in San Diego. And, you know, what I like to do in my free time is clear that out. We're building, you know, little 
sort of cottages. We're going to build an off grid spa and just place where people can come and attach with Nate, like connect with nature. That's sort of a, a long term project, but I don't know. It's just all these sort of synergies that I'm finding in my life just make it really easy to get up and go. So, of everything that you've done in your life up to this point, what are you the proudest of? Hmm. You know, I'm, I think I'm the proudest of not selling out. Um, and I, and I mean that just, uh, I, this is like that long journey of finding yourself and, and getting comfortable in your skin. And then, you know, having opportunities presented in front of me where I felt like I could have maybe received more out of them from like my financial or whatever it might be by, by putting on a face and, and, and playing that role and just never doing it. So if you have a dream tonight, you run into the 20 year old version of you and you could give that version of you a piece of advice based on the wisdom that you've gained in your life. What would you tell that young version of you? People will like you more if you don't try to please them. Would that version of you listen? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Absolutely not. Because nope. <laughs> we got it all figured out when we're young, you know? Oh yeah, I, I knew so much more when I was 20 than I do now. It's crazy. In my head, at least. You know? <laughs> well, the, the the interesting thing is I always remember the poet Charles Bukowski said, we're born geniuses mm -hmm. and buried idiots. And it, yep. and it is because we put up so many fences. And I think the Rolodex gets filled up. There's so many things that go into getting older on this planet. Yep. You know, you know what I also think? I think about that as well. And I think there is something to the fact that you think about the first 20 years of your life, like from, from age 20 to 21, you gain five percent of new like life experience and knowledge so you do actually get so much more experience and wisdom each year but then you extrapolate that out and that you know sort of marginal new wisdom is less and less and less each year even though you are getting wiser i don't know i just feel like you feel more constant over time i, I you know I, I don't know how to explain that but i i kind of always had that feeling like the amount of new life experiences that are super profound between the age of 18 and 20 versus the age for a normal person's life between 38 and 40 or something like that. It's, it's just such a larger influence on who you are at age 20, those last two years than who you are at age 40, those last two years. Yeah. Uh, unless you have something profound that's very life-changing happen, but you know, on average it's, so it makes you have that sort of ego about, Oh man, I really know things, but yeah, you don't know anything when you're 20. That's right. That's a fact. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. So yeah. if you could see any event in human history firsthand with your own eyes, what would you love to have seen? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, there's like a couple of ways that I, that I would think about this. On the darker side of things, I would have loved to see storming the beach at Normandy, not for enjoyment, but for perspective, I think. Yeah. Um, Cause I think that was just one of the, days in history that people nowadays just don't even wrap their head around and understand what what the world experienced then uh really it's just absolutely crazy to me yeah um but then beyond that i think uh and this might me just being a vikings nerd i think i would have liked to be in that first viking longboat that uh saw the shores of great britain and ireland yeah that would be cool yeah. for sure so everyone out there has a perception of you, family, friends, clients, colleagues, but you're running the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? I think I'm Colton. I like it. See, yep. er, every time I ask that question, it, it like sparks this like PhD dissertation possibility. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's just really simple. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That, that's, I mean, and I, I understand that that, that answer is going to change and have nuances and ebb and flow, but, uh, you know, I think I just am who I am. I dig it. Colton, if anyone yeah. wants to learn more about you, hire you, be a part of anything revolving around your world, where do they go? Um, well, you can find me on LinkedIn, Colton Cranston, and you can also go to coltoncranston.com, which is right now under reconstruction. Just but looking at your interior, yeah, looking at your interior there just feels like San Diego. I feel like I'm back. Yep. It just, it just yep. has a different feeling to it. <laughs> yeah, every, everything everything's beachy and breezy. Alive. <laughs> it's just yep. alive. It's bright. It's colorful. It's good. So, well, this is great, man. Cranston, thank you. Or Colton, I'm sorry. Thank you for taking a minute out today to talk about your life and, and opening up the book. I really appreciate it. And I hope that at some point, 
you do run into Rogan. And if you have the chance mm-hmm. to have another spot at the table, I'll be there with you. All right, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> All right. It's on the bucket list. So, yeah. hey, thank you so much for having me. This was fun. Yeah, absolutely, man. Cheers. Have a good day. You too. See ya.